Did you know that Oscar Wilde was a Nepo baby? His mother was Jane Francesca Agnes Elgi, a poet who wrote for the Irish nationalist newspaper The Nation under the pseudonym Speranza, meaning hope in Italian. In 1848, one of her pieces actually prompted the government to shut down the publication on grounds of sedition. When Oscar's own literary star was on the rise a few decades later, some people still just called him Speranza's son. Oscar's dad was no slacker either. William Wilde was mid-19th century Ireland's most famous ophthalmic surgeon, which might be the most niche claim to fame in history, but hey, it's something. He also edited a scientific journal and published some of his own writings. In Oscar's 1897 long-form letter, De Profundis, he wrote that his parents had bequeathed me a name they had made noble and honored, not merely in literature, art, archeology, span and science, but in the public history of my own country, in its evolution as a nation. Big big shoes. Hi, I'm Erin McCarthy, editor-in-chief of mentalfloss.com. These days, the term Nepo baby, short for nepotism baby, is most often levied against a famous entertainer descended from another famous entertainer or affluent family of some kind, like Dakota Johnson, whose parents are Melanie Griffith and Don Johnson, or law and order legend Mariska Hargitay, whose mom was blonde bombshell Jane Mansfield. More loosely though, a Nepo baby could be anyone whose forebears paved the way for their own success whether via helpful connections in a given industry or just because familial wealth freed them up to pursue their passions. On this episode of The List Show, we're covering a handful of historical figures who you might not have realized were Nepo babies, from actors like Charlie Chaplin to ancient politicians like Pericles. Let's get started. Charlie Chaplin is such a household name that you probably assumed he was the origin point of his own Nepo baby chain. His kids include the actor Geraldine Chaplin, who is also descended from Eugene O'Neill, and her kids include Una Chaplin, whom Game of Thrones fans know best as Lady Talisa, wife of Rob Stark. But Charlie Chaplin's backstory has notes of nepotism in it too. His parents, Charles Chaplin Sr. and Hannah Chaplin, stage name Lily Harley, were both comic performers in 19th century British musical halls. Charlie Jr. got his stage start at age nine in a traveling clogging troupe called the Eight Lancashire Lads. Too bad reality TV didn't exist back then because I just know clogger dads would have made dance moms look tame. The whole thing was Charlie Sr.'s idea. He knew the troupe's manager and was probably trying to get his son a paying job so he wouldn't be on the hook for child support payments. Famed French impressionist Pierre-Auguste Renoir fostered the filmmaking career of his son Jean Renoir in a different way. In 1924, Jean financed his first movie, Catherine, or Une Vie Sans Joie, by selling some paintings by his father, who had died five years prior. Many a film buff considers Jean Renoir just as talented as his dad. His 1939 film La Regla de Jeu, or The Rules of the Game, came in 13th on Sight and Sound's 2022 list of the greatest films of all time. Jumping over to politics, George H.W. Bush wasn't the patriarch of the Bush political dynasty. His father, Prescott Bush, was a Republican senator for Connecticut from 1952 to 1963. Prescott's dad, Samuel Prescott Bush, was a wealthy Ohio industrialist who served on the federal government's War Industries Board during World War I. Two of George H.W.'s kids, former President George W. Bush and former Florida Governor Jeb Bush, have stretched the family's political legacy to four generations, if you count Samuel's government work. Jeb's son, George P. Bush, is doing his best to keep it going. He was the Texas Land Commissioner from 2015 to 2023 and formed a political action committee in May 2023. I have to assume the P in George P. Bush stands for politics. Oh no, wait, it's Prescott. Somebody buy the Bushes a baby name book. George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush are one of just two father-son presidential pairs in U.S. history. The other duo is John Adams and his son, John Quincy Adams. Historian David McCullough told the Washington Post in 2000 that John Adams saw the rise of his son with nothing but pleasure. Although he worried about the strain of the presidency on him, it seems pretty apparent he saw his son as redeeming his defeat. The elder Adams had lost his reelection campaign in 1800 to Thomas Jefferson. Ah, fathers using their sons as a way to redeem their own failures. That's always healthy. While we're on the topic of US presidents, let's talk about the Harrisons. Benjamin Harrison held the office from 1889 to 1893. Not only was he the son of a congressman, but he was also the grandson of a president, William Henry Harrison, and the great-grandson of Benjamin Harrison V who signed the Declaration of Independence. Politics ran in Pericles' family too. The ancient Greek statesman is generally credited with kickstarting the Golden Age of Athens in the fifth century BCE. 
During his tenure as the de facto head of Athens' Democratic Assembly, the city became Greece's cultural and political epicenter. Building the Parthenon, for example, was Pericles' idea. But without his parents' pedigree, he wouldn't have had the power or money to get into governing in the first place. His mother, Agarist, was a member of the extremely influential and wealthy Alcmyonid family, and his father was a wealthy politician named Xanthippus. Leo Tolstoy also came from a long line of nobles. The Anna Karenina author was a count descended from Peter Andreevich Tolstoy, who had been made a count back in 1724. As historian Harlow Robinson wrote in 1983, to be born a Tolstoy was to enter one of the most celebrated, talented, and resilient families in Russian history, and to take one's place in a line of artists, writers, diplomats, scoundrels, and eccentrics that stretched back to the 14th century. Few families in any country have succeeded, century after century, in maintaining such a preeminent position in political, artistic, and social life. The Kardashians work hard, but the Tolstoys work harder. Charles Darwin wasn't the first scientific smarty in the Darwin family. His paternal grandfather was Erasmus Darwin, a poet, physician, botanist, and naturalist who wrote a theory of evolution in his 1794 book, Zoonomia, or The Laws of Organic Life. In Charles's autobiography, written in 1876, he gave his grandfather a backwards hat tip of sorts for inspiring him to study evolution. I had previously read the Zoonomia of my grandfather, but without producing any effect on me. Nevertheless, it is probable that the hearing rather early in life, such views maintained and praised, may have favored my upholding them under a different form in my origin of species. At this time, I admired greatly the Zoonomia, but on reading it a second time after an interval of 10 or 15 years, I was much disappointed. The proportion of speculation being so large to the facts given. Now you see why I called it a backwards hat tip. Old Erasmus isn't the only grandparent to be hugely eclipsed in the history books by their grandkid. When you say the name Ludwig van Beethoven, nobody asks, which one? But the composer's grandfather was also named Ludwig van Beethoven, and he too was a musician. Ludwig the Elder was born in Flanders, modern Belgium, and made his debut as a church choir singer at age five. He learned to play the organ and bounced around various churches as a choir director or singer before moving to Bonn in modern Germany, where he became the court's official music director in 1761. Though Beethoven was just a few years old when his grandfather died, he held him in very high esteem his whole life, as evidenced by the portrait of Ludwig the Elder that always hung in Beethoven's house. If I tried to list all the writers whose parents were also writers, I'd be sitting here longer than it takes to actually write a book. But here's a quick highlight reel. Mary Shelley, author of Frankenstein, was the daughter of a philosophy power couple. Mary Wollstonecraft, who penned the feminist classic A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, and William Godwin, often cited as the founder of philosophical anarchism. Basically, he thought governments were stunting our ability to reason, and humankind could only really progress if state institutions didn't exist at all. Maybe in an anarchist society, more people would remember that Frankenstein is the name of the doctor. Mental floss tangent. Also, to be even more of a stickler, Dr. Frankenstein isn't actually a doctor. He's a medical student in the book. We cover even more frustrating Frankenstein misconceptions in our episode about literature. Check it out. English novelist Martin Amis is best known for books like Money and London Fields. His father, Kingsley Amis, was also a novelist. His debut novel, a satire of university life called Lucky Jim, hit shelves in 1954. In 1990, People's Jonathan Cooper described the father-son pair as close, though they share a clamorously public rivalry. Here's what Kingsley had to say about London Fields. I suppose I should have tried to read every page, but it was beyond me. That's British for I love you, son. Virginia Woolf's father was English philosopher and literary critic Leslie Stephen, who edited the first Dictionary of National Biography, which the National Portrait Gallery describes as the most ambitious literary project of its day. Stephen actually got knighted in 1902 for his contributions to the field of literature. Other celebrated writers were more generally born into the world of academia. T.S. Eliot's grandfather was the co-founder of Washington University in St. Louis, and Emily Dickinson's grandfather helped finance the establishment of Amherst College in the early 1820s. Ursula K. Le Guin's father was Alfred Kroeber, an acclaimed anthropologist who helped popularize anthropology as an academic and professional field of study in the U.S. In 1935, Irene Julio Curie and her husband, Frederick Julio, took home the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their work in synthesizing new radioactive elements. Irene's mother, Marie Curie, had won the same prize back in 1911, also for working with radioactive elements. Eight years before that, Marie and her husband, Irene's father, Pierre, had won the Physics Prize for, you guessed it, studying radiation. 
Irin is one of no less than eight Nobel Prize winners with a Nobel Prize winning parent or two in Erin's case. Let's end with Louis Zuborowski, a race car driver who, in the 1920s, developed a series of cars called Chitty Bang Bang, which inspired Ian Fleming's 1964 kids book, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, The Magical Car, and the 1968 movie musical based on it. You heard that right, the same guy created James Bond and everyone's favorite flying car. Seems like you'd need some serious capital to fund the invention of a flashy new race car, and Louis had it in spades. His dad, Elliot Zaborowski, was a race car driver from New Jersey who had inherited millions from his businessman father. There was big money on Lewis's mother's side too. She was a member of New York's famed Astor family. Lewis was far from the Astor's only Nepo baby, but he was probably the only one who indirectly gave us a musical in which Dick Van Dyke goes undercover as a weird clown doll to rescue a bunch of kids from an evil despot. So I'm actually pro Nepo baby in this case. That's not to say we're knocking all other Nepo babies. Plenty of them have earned their places in history, but it's always good to acknowledge the doors open to people who have rich relatives or, you know, a dad who knows the manager of a clogging troupe. Thanks for watching The List Show. Make sure to subscribe to get even more videos about historical Nepo babies, or, you know, equally niche and interesting topics. And I'll see you next time.